Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Is that week five, to, uh, yes. Todd? Week two, week two. I think there's an issue with that in that he, uh, uh, topic three. PB Watts quiz, and then edit settings. I can do one thing at a time. Just hold that okay. thought. Um, you can't do I'm going to try, but I don't know. <laughs> so close the quiz March 1st. Let's disable. We'll, we'll keep it enabled, but I'm going to keep that open until uh, the end of May for you. Okay, so PV Watts quiz is now open. You can take that. Next. Um, and then, I don't know, do you have the module ratings quiz open still? Can you tell me which one that is? Uh, let's see. Um, topic five. Topic five, module ratings quiz. This one right here? Yeah, is that still open? Let's just take a look at settings. timing. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and enable. It, it opens today, oh. uh, and then I'll just leave it open through May as well. So else yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sound good? Good. Super. Super, yeah. All right. Well, so we just, we kind of, we ran through batteries. We did chapter six, now let's take a look at uh, week seven, charge controllers. So uh, the, the same little analogy that we looked at, um, it's, it's the same problem in reverse. And in fact, the way I just described it is um, more relevant to charge controllers because if you think of the people going to the room as energizing the battery, you, you want to be able to um, shove electrons into the battery at a rate that it can accept. So what I showed here was more or less the discharge rate. And um, yeah, so you can, you can think of the, um, well, if you think of it, the, the, the discharge rate should be a little more steady state, actually, than the charging rate. Because if, if you think of these doors, and I'll just draw this. This is sort of the, the discharge rate. So if electricity is sort of flowing out here. The discharge rate should be relatively steady because what you're accessing are all of these sites kind of at the periphery. And you might say, well, okay, so I've got you know, these, these five plus these five, and those, those extra two, I've got these 14 aisle seats, if you will, that can come out kind of quickly, and then uh, it's going to take a little longer for those remaining six to get out. Um, so they're not unrelated. The discharge rate and the charge controller rate are, are highly related. So in the charge controller, if you, um, if you put too many electrons in too quickly, they might actually just go and bind these very easily accessible sites. And then we'll, you say, well, OK, um, push a few more in, and you'll kick them into the, the deeper binding sites. And the, the, the charge controller is going to be looking at a couple different things. So let's just, um, let's just look at this for a So let's just say your battery's, you know, down around um, 11 volts. The charge rate should be high. Because you want to, because you want to get the thing up to 12 volts. And, you know, and why, why wait, wait around? Let's just get the, you know, get the electrons in there. Um, if you are at, let's just say, uh, 12 volts, charge rate uh, should be lower. Now you might ask, well, gosh, if you're at 12 volts, shouldn't, shouldn't you just stop? Uh, no, because in, in any battery, you know, 
we can walk out there to the wind turbine trailer right now, and we're going to read 13, 13.2 volts on those batteries. And that's when you know they're really full. Um, so even at 12 volts, you're still going to keep pumping electrons in there because there, there will be, again, a few little holes here and there, you know, throw, throw another electron in, and it'll, it'll make its way eventually and fill up these holes. So you're kind of always forced. You can think of it as, um, you know, packing a suitcase. And you might think the thing is really full, but, yeah, I can probably sneak a golf ball into a shoe or, or you know, pour a bunch of sand in there. <laughs> it's going to fill up some space. So you, you can't do it as quickly, but there's, there's still some room. And then uh, eventually, let's just say we're at, uh, uh, you know, 13 volts uh, charge rate. Um, at a trickle. And why would you keep, and you might have heard of trickle chargers before. Why would you do that? Well, everything leaks. Everything. Sorry. Bicycle tires, batteries, nuclear power plants. I was talking <laughs> with Wally about, he's like, I don't know if I told, I don't know if you are in the room when uh, I was first talking about this or not. Todd, but it, um, Anagawa, let me see if I can look this up. It's fascinating. <laughs> there we go. Anagawa power plant. We also had a chance to, to visit this. They're um, just north of Fukushima. We parked our bus up here, walked in, got, got the actual lecture from the plant manager who was on duty when the, when the tsunami hit. They were predicting to get a six to nine meter wave. It came in at 13 and a half meters tall. Their wall was 14 meters tall. They were that far from, you know, cresting over. They are now rebuilding a 29 meter tall wall, uh, and it's, it's not even shown in these pictures. From here to here, I mean, if 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 this were picture were taken now, you you couldn't see most of the plant. It's a hundred feet tall. It's 800 feet long. It's six feet thick, uh, tubular steel and concrete. It's gigantic, and in some ways, I'm thinking, well, gosh, let's just use that tsunami power instead of the nuclear power. <laughs> and and it, it, it does have some relevance to what we're talking about in terms of charge controllers, because what they're doing right back here in, in the back is uh, they're building two giant water storage tanks, not unlike a, a battery storage. And in fact, we're, we're looking down in there. Let me just let me show you because there's a, there's a lot of analogies here, and we, we always we always make analogies between you know water and electricity. So they've got two two big tanks, and um, I don't know. Well, why two? Well, the Vulcans have two of every organ, right? In case one fails, and and that's that's a pretty good way to design something. In fact, we're just buying parts now for our solar car, our electric car. And Lee's like, should I buy one? Well, no, buy two, because one's going to break. We're going to be at the race, and one's going to break. So just buy two. And, but inside, um, inside these tanks, so this is a top view. They've got these little um, walls, little bat, well, I think there's just, yeah, six chambers total. And what they're doing, th these are just baffles to allow the water to flow out at a, at a more, um, reasonable rate. That's all it is. Because we're like, why do you need those baffles? Well, it's just, it's just flow control. And it's the same thing with your um, charge controller, is when you're already full, you can't, you can't pack that much more in. But these tanks have dual purposes. One is, if, if the core is getting hot, right, if the, if the system fails to, to uh, you know, shove the neutron absorbers out or pull the, pull the uh, hot rods out, this water can then be used to cool it. 
And just talking with Wally Higgins, like, well, don't those things leak radioactivity into the ocean? Well, of course they do. I mean, you, you, it, it, it's, it's statistical because, I mean, the walls are six foot thick concrete, but in the, in the, typically you're not going to see radiation inside of these uh, water containers. But, you know, let's say this is your reactor. There's always a finite probability that some radiation is going to make, make it out of there. Because solid matter, if you ever watched Buckaroo Banzai, ain't so solid. <laughs> some, there's a lot of space inside of, uh, inside of solid matter. But the other reason um, that I see for these things being so deep, you know, let's say a tsunami does come up over this 100-foot wall they're building. Um, if the earthquake occurs offshore, they've got about 40 minutes before the wave hits. They could, they could um, well, I guess you're gambling at that point. But if like, oh man, here comes a really big one, they could drain those tanks ahead of time and allow them to absorb some of the water that comes in over the wall, if, if it does. And that way, um, you still have some, some cooling capacity. Anyway, it was really impressive. Okay, what else do we know, you know about sol uh, charge controllers here before I take off? Um, you know, I, I would go in and just just read, you know, hit, hit the highlights, see what the main categories of charge controllers are. In fact, there's your, there's your water example. <laughs> you know, so w once it's starting to get full, you slow down on your charge rate. Um, yeah, so the charge controller is always measuring, um, measuring the voltage. Another thing to, to check out, and here's where there's a lot of overlap between renewable energy and, <clears throat> and electronics technology. Typically in a, in a system, most systems will only run at a certain voltage, you know, unless you've got some fancy regulator. So if you want to vary the rate at which the voltage is going in, you just turn it on and off. You just, you pulse it. Because it's, because it's either going to be at 12 volts or zero. You don't, you don't have a choice. So instead of like, oh, should I choose? You can't choose. You can only choose how long it's on. So the charge controller is also uh, running that. And this is called pulse width, width modulation. We talked a little bit about maximum power point tracking, too. Um, that's where you're taking the product of voltage and current, so you've got the maximum power coming in. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that batteries themselves have separate cells. Not unlike this little scribble that I made here. Each, each, and each cell, to take it all the way back to the physics, each cell is going to be um, dictated by its electronegativity. So every single, um, let's just look at lead for a second. I'm sorry that's so um, hard to read, but electronegativity, maybe we can make it a little bit bigger of lead, 1.83, electronegativity of, of lithium, 0.98, sodium, 0.93. So depending on the relative electronegativities of the individual elements in your battery, that's going to tell you basically how many, how many volts you can get. And it's just based on the, the actual physical properties of the elements that the battery is made of. Um, so. Just, just sort of keep that in mind in terms of looking at how many cells you have to put together in order to hit a certain voltage. And that's why, and I, I know I've already covered this to some degree, that's why in a, um, in a PV cell, I, I guess I can keep coming back to this, this drawing, use it for water, I can use it for <laughs> PV, you have to wire your individual PV cells in series so that you can hit a critical voltage. Each one of these cells is only going to be about a half a volt. That's also why if you've got shading on a portion of the module, the whole thing goes down because they're, because they're wired in series, just like um, Christmas lights. I didn't really fully appreciate that, but anyway. 
So each one's going to be this, at a low low voltage. Put them in series. Voltage is add, and there you get your high voltage. So definitely keep that in mind as well. Because it's right there in Chapter 7. Okay, I would love to hang out longer. I have to give my talk at the Mansfield Center. I hope it goes well. I've got way too many slides. Oh, let me show you. A little bit, yeah. Uh, lecture series. I think it's right here. Ooh, there it is. The Confluence of Renewable Energy and Human Health. Putting ourselves to work for a human-powered future. So, I don't know. If, if you haven't seen it, here's my, um, here's my uh, home page for my little business. So, I don't That's why, you know, I, I love riding my bike around, and, and I kind of look and, and wonder why more people don't ride their bikes because, you know, the weather's so great right now, and, and uh, saves you on your gym membership and all that. But anyway, that's, um, that, that's my talk. So I've got, I've got one new slide, but I'm going to show where um, just use pedal power to filter the air inside your gym for you. Because if it's, if it's junky air outside, you just suck. But if it's, if it's poor air quality but cold and you want it colder inside, you, you pull it in through a filter. If it's, um, well, junky air inside and you don't really want all that dust and hair and all the other crap that you have to be vacuuming, pump it outside. And then at the end, what you end up with, I'm giving all my great ideas away, it's okay. At the end, what you end up with is a um, insulating layer of just dust and crud inside your wall, and that becomes your insulator. So it's a uh, filter now, and then you don't have to throw anything away. You just have this nice uh, organic matter keeping your, uh, keeping your house warm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, this this used to be the case. You like, this hiring the housekeeper. That's right. That's right. That's right. Back in back in the day, um, like some of these really old um, hotels, the the when it was before disposable razors, before the plastic disposable, like the blade, the metal blades are disposable, and you'd put it in a slot in the wall. There was no disposal. It's just the the wall was a cavity. So you might have these. Hotels that are like 50, 60 years old with 50 pounds of razor blades inside the wall. <laughs> yeah. There were, no, there were no trash cans in public in Japan. None. Zero. But it was still, but it was still very clean. Yeah. I saw three cigarette butts on the ground the whole time and maybe one plastic bottle. And I was looking. And at the, at the mall, there were two trash cans. One said combustibles and the other one said non-combustibles. So I'm thinking, you know, like, yeah, it was impressive. It was impressive, yeah.